Hello everyone. I am going to be talking about sound, precise and fast abstract interpretation with tri-state numbers. I am Harishankar Vishwanathan and this is work done with Matan Shatnai, Srinivas Narayana and Santosh Nagarkati at Rutgers University. EBPF or Extended Berkeley Packet Filter is a recent technology that is gaining widespread adoption. Companies like Netflix, Facebook and Google use EBPF as a core part of their infrastructure. EBPF is especially useful in high performance networking, monitoring and security. Static analysis is crucial to the safety and viability of EBPF. EBPF performs static analysis using several abstractions. We study the domain of tri-state numbers. Our work improves the speed, precision and soundness of EBPF static analysis using tri-state numbers. We present a new algorithm that is faster and more precise than the existing algorithm in the kernel. It has been merged in the latest Linux kernels. We also prove that the other algorithms in this domain are sound and maximally precise. So what is eBPF? eBPF helps extend the operating system with user supplied code. eBPF programs are attached to specific events in the kernel. The programs are triggered when those events occur in the kernel. In the image here, an eBPF program is attached and invoked when the application performs a specific system call. EBPF programs are written in a high-level language like C and compiled to eBPF bytecode. The bytecode instruction set includes arithmetic and logic operations, load and store instructions for memory access, and branching. eBPF code is just-in-time compiled to the native architecture of the machine. Progra programs are then run directly in kernel context with little additional checks at runtime. Now, clearly running arbitrary user-supplied code in the kernel context comes with risks. The solution adopted by the eBPF ecosystem is to statically prove the safety of the user program before running it. And this is where the eBPF verifier comes in. The verifier is a static analyzer that proves program safety. Program safety refers to the following properties. Does the user code always terminate? Does it do any illegal operations like dividing by zero? Does it only access memory regions permitted by the kernel? Only after the verifier accepts the program will the program be attached to the specific kernel event. The verifier can be invoked using the BPF system call. <coughs> Static analysis in the eBPF verifier must be sound, precise and fast. Soundness means that the verifier should reject unsafe programs as shown on the bottom right. In doing so, it may reject some safe programs, but that's okay. Precision means that the verifier shouldn't reject safe programs due to imprecision in its analysis. Ideally, we want an analysis which is both sound and precise, one which accepts all safe programs and rejects all unsafe programs. But writing correct static analysis is hard. In 2021 alone, there have been at least seven vulnerabilities in the CVE database related to bugs in the static analysis in the verifier. Additionally, verification should also be fast because it's a mandatory step in the process of loading the program. To show that the eBPF program is safe to execute, a static analyzer needs to reason about all executions of the program effectively. One such task the verifier undertakes is to reason about all possible values the program variables can take across all executions. Why? Such analysis could be used to show that a memory address is safe to read or write in all executions. To make this analysis practical, the verifier over approximates the set of actual va values of program variables using abstract values drawn from an abstract domain. That is, the verifier uses abstract interpretation. The verifier uses multiple abstract domains to track the properties of variables as shown below. Among these, the bitwise domain tracks the individual bits of a program variable. The kernel calls this the domain of tri-state numbers because for the purposes of tracking, each bit in a program variable can either be known to be zero known to be one or unknown, denoted here as mu. Let's look at variables as if they had only four bits. Suppose we want to track the individual bits of a four bit variable x in this eBPF program snippet. Tnum x can be used to track x. Initially, we don't know anything about x, so all of Tnum x is set to unknown. On line one, x is the result of the logical and of some unknown external variable called input with eight. Even though we don't know anything about input, we can say for sure that X's least significant three bits are certainly zero. Only the most significant bit may be set, if at all. As X undergoes further operations, the value of tnum X is accordingly updated. 
Importantly, the information encoded in tnum x can be used to infer that the value of x will always be either 0, either 4 or 6 in all executions. This can later be used to determine the safety of the memory access at line 42. Now the Linux kernel specifies algorithms for abstract operators on tnums like tnumx as the program variable x undergoes concrete operations. So for our work, we sought out to answer the question, can we formally verify the core algorithms in the verifier related to tri-state numbers and the operations on tri-state numbers? So this brings us to the contributions of our work. First, we attempted to verify the soundness of the kernel's algorithms for tri-state numbers using SMT. We encoded the algorithms in first order logic using finite width bit vectors. We were able to verify the soundness of all the kernel's algorithms except the one for multiplication. This is because multiplication, as we will see, has large unrolled loops and the verification doesn't complete in time. This led us to developing our own multiplication algorithm, which we call our mul. In the paper, we present an analytical proof of its soundness for operands of unbounded bit width. Our new algorithm is more precise and 33% faster than the existing algorithm. It has already been merged into the latest Linux kernels. Also in the paper, we present a proof of why the addition and subtraction operation defined in the Linux kernel are maximally precise. In the interest of time, I will focus on our contribution related to tnum multiplication. But first, let's start with an introduction to the tnum abstract domain. To recall, a digit in a tnum can take one of three values. We call such a digit a trit for ternary digit. An n trit tnum tracks an n bit program variable. We call the domain of all tnums the abstract domain and the domain of all n bit program variables integers the concrete domain. Here are some examples of four trit tnums and the elements from the concrete domain tracked by the tnums. As we can see in the third example, a tnum with more mu trits abstracts a larger set of concrete integers than a tnum with fewer mu trits, like in the second example. Every tnum abstracts a set of concrete n bit integers. The concrete domain is thus the set of all possible sets of n bit integers, that is, the power set of n bit integers. It is useful to visualize the relationship between the elements of the abstract and concrete domains in the form of a picture. This slide will show what is known as the Hasse diagram for the abstract domain and the concrete domains for n equal to 2, that is tnums and integers of width 2. Elements of the concrete domain, the power set of integers, form a partial order with the subset relation as the ordering relation among them. An arrow from a lower element to a higher element means that the lo lower element is a subset of the higher element. Elements of the abstract domain also form a partial order. For example, one mu is visualized as containing the tnum 1 1. In abstract interpretation, we define two functions called the abstraction function and the concretization function. The abstraction function alpha takes an element from the concrete domain and produces an abstract value. Here, alpha takes the set 2 3 and converts it to one mu. The concretization function gamma produces a concrete set from an abstract value. We can also define abstract versions of concrete operators in the abstract domain. For example, we can take, we can abstract the log concrete logical AND operator into an abstract logical AND operator that takes as input two tnums and produces an output tnum. Now, <clears throat> to soundly analyze PPF programs, we need to define tnum abstract operators corresponding to the following well-known operators over registers supported by the BPF instruction set but how to implement these operators. One standard way to do this is to concretize, do the operation f and then abstract. Basically composing the concretization function, the operator function and the abstraction function. Let's say we are trying to come up with a way to do addition on tnums. The compositional way to do this would be to first take the two tnums and concretize them to obtain the sets that they abstract. Next, we do the concrete addition on the elements of these sets taken pairwise to obtain another set. Finally, we apply the abstraction function to get the final tnum. This is infeasible to do in practice. There will be two raised to two n pairwise additions in the worst case, and it defeats the purpose of approximation using abstractions. So we need to define abstract operators that operate on the abstract values directly without generating these intermediate concrete set of values. The construction using composition described in the previous slide is a sound way to implement an abstract operator. But what is the meaning of soundness? 
let's say we have a concrete operator f this could be addition subtraction etc which takes two integers and produces an integer we are trying to define an abstract operator g corresponding to f which takes as input two tnums and produces a tnum let's see what the soundness criteria is for such an operator let's say we have two tnums p and q we first concretize them to obtain the concrete set of integers they abstract then we perform the concrete operation f on the members of these two sets pairwise to obtain a resultant set let's call this set x next consider the abstract operator g it produces a tnum r directly from p and q we take this result tnum r and concretize it suppose we call this set y the soundness criteria for the abstract operator g asks does y contain x for all input tnums p and q now we can also talk about maximal precision of an abstract operator let's take the concrete set x and apply the abstraction function alpha to it to obtain the tnum s the tnum operator g is maximally precise if the result r it produced is exactly the same as s note that the tnum result r need not always be exactly the same as s to be sound it just needs to approximate over approximate the set abstracted by s developing sound and efficient abstract operators for arithmetic like addition subtraction multiplication etc is not trivial and one of the reasons for this is that uncertainty propagates in non obvious ways consider tnum variables tnum x tnum y and tnum z which are tracking program variables x y and z respectively let's say that at this program point tnum x is all ones and tnum y is a single trait tnum mu tnum uh, z is the concrete addition of x and y so tnum z has to be the result of the tnum addition of tnum x and tnum y now tnum y is mu which means that y can either be 0 or 1 if y were 0 then all the bits of z would be 1 if y were 1 then all the bits of z would be 0 due to overflow hence all the traits of tnum z have to be uncertain so even though one trait is uncertain across both the operands all the traits in the output are uncertain this is why doing arithmetic in the bitwise domain is not trivial prior work on similar abstract domains like the bitfield domain of mine and the bitwise domain of rigor are restricted in that they do not show arithmetic operations or present much slower versions than the corresponding operators presented in the linux kernel the linux kernel does have implementations for arithmetic operators of addition subtraction and multiplication shown here is the linux kernel's implementation of tnum addition but notably it has no proofs of soundness or precision for them i will now talk about our contribution related to tnum multiplication but first let's talk about multiplying two decimal numbers here q is the multiplicand and p is the multiplier we pick each digit of the multiplier p along with its place value and multiply it with the entirety of the multiplicand in this way we get a partial product for each digit in the multiplier p which we sum up to get the final result this is pretty straightforward to multiply two binary numbers is even more straightforward because the digits of the multiplier can only be either 0 or 1 if the digit is 0 then we can skip this step entirely if the digit is 1 we just add the multiplicand to the result since 1 times any t any number is the same number the multiplicand must be left shifted by some number of bits according to the place value of the multiplier this algorithm to multiply two binary numbers using just addition and shifts is commonly referred to as long multiplication all the existing algorithms for abstract multiplication draw inspiration from long multiplication now if we are to use this algorithm for tnum multiplication we need to add some new rules for an unknown digit mu the entries in blue are the same as concrete binary multiplication 0 times 0 equal to 0 and so on the entries in green correspond in correspond to multiplication by the uncertain trait mu these should be intuitive too zero times any number is zero hence zero times mu is equal to zero and so on it follows from the multiplication table that when we multiply the single trait tnum zero with a tnum of arbitrary length the result should be zero similarly when we multiply the single trait tnum one with any tnum the result should be the same tnum importantly 
when we multiply the single trait tenum mu with any tenum, the result should be such that all the one traits in the tenum are changed to mu. So mu0 1 times mu is mu0 mu. The existing algorithm for multiplication of tenums in the Linux kernel is shown here. I'm not going to go into the details of this algorithm. However, a key point is that the algorithm uses two loops over the digits of the multiplier and adds up 2n plus 1 partial products. The addition must occur using tenum addition since the partial products are all abstract. As we will show now, we can improve both the precision and speed of this overall operation. The first improvement we observe is that we can just add n partial products to implement multiplication. Consider two tenums P and Q as shown on the right. For this example, we're just using tenums of width 3. We start with an accumulator tenum ACK, which accumulates the result. It is set to 0. Then we have a loop which runs three times, and in each iteration, we just consider one digit of P starting from the LSB. We left shift Q by 1 in every iteration to take into account the place value. Note that the shift here happens using the abstract version of the usual shift operator. Also note that there are only three possible cases for the LSB of P. It could be either 0, 1, or mu. Let's first see the case where the LSB of P is a certain one. In this case, 1 times any tenum is the same tenum, so the result produced is just Q. It is added to the accumulator as it is. Recall again that as ACK is accumulating partial products, it is doing so using the abstract addition operator, which soundly takes care of carries. We see the first partial product mu10. Next, the LSB of P is a certain zero. 0 times any tenum is 0, so we don't need to account for this case at all, and the accumulator remains unchanged. Next is the interesting case where the LSB of P is uncertain or mu. Recall that multiplying a tenum mu with a tenum with mu should convert all of its one traits to mu, and everything else remains the same. Q, when left shifted by 2, is mu 1 0 0 0, and when multiplied by mu, gives mu mu 0 0 0. When added to the accumulator, we get mu 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 1 0. This is the final result of the multiplication of P and Q. With this, we have an algorithm that is a starter for tenum multiplication. We improve the precision of this last algorithm by leveraging some specific properties of tenum abstract addition. We call this final algorithm our mul. Instead of a single accumulator ACK, our mul decomposes the addition into two accumulator tenums. Informally, ACK C and ACK U correspond to the certain and uncertain parts of the partial products respectively. Going back to our example, if the least significant trait of P is 1, then ACK C accumulates the known traits in Q. That is, Q with all of its mu traits set to 0. ACK U accumulates only the uncertain traits of Q. All other traits are set to 0. When the LSB of the multiplier is 0, we don't need to accumulate anything and the accumulators remain unchanged. When the least significant trait of P is mu, ACK C remains unchanged. However, ACK U accumulates a tenum with all of Q's one traits set to mu. Q when left shifted by its place value is mu1000 and when multiplied by mu gives mu mu000. When this partial product is added to the accumulator, we get mu mu mu00. Our mul finally returns the tenum addition of ACK C and ACK U. We also observe that ACK C only does addition of concrete partial products and can be this can be turned into a single efficient multiple operation, multiplication operation. Thus, our mul also accumulates roughly 2n partial products by tenum addition. Our mul is faster and generally more precise than the kernel's prior algorithm and other known algorithms. These benefits arise from the number and order of the abstract partial products considered by our mul. First, we evaluate the performance of our algorithm compared to the kernel's algorithm. We generate 40 million random tenum pairs. These tenums are of width 64 as the kernel uses 64 trait tenums. Performance is measured simply using the time it takes in CPU cycles to perform the multiplication. What is shown here is a CDF of the cycles taken by each algorithm. We observe that in general, R mul in green is faster than kern mul in blue. On average, kern mul takes around 393 cycles and R mul takes around 262 cycles. So overall, it is 33% faster. 
Next, we evaluate the precision of our algorithm. It doesn't make sense to evaluate the precision on randomly sampled TNUM inputs. And generating TNUMs of width 64, all pairs of TNUMs of width 64 is infeasible. Hence, we enumerate all possible TNUM pairs of width 8 and multiply them using both the algorithms. It turns out that for around 99% of the input TNUM pairs, Kernmal produces the same output as Awamal. We consider only the remaining cases for the plot. This is still a large number of TNUMs. To measure precision, we compare the cardinalities of the sets produced by the result of the multiplication. If the set is smaller, then the algorithm produced a more precise TNUM. We again plot a CDF. The x-axis is the ratio of the cardinalities of TNUMs produced by Kernmal to Awamal. We use a log-based 2 plot because the cardinalities are always powers of 2. The data to the right of 0 in the figure is the case where Rmal produced a TNUM that is smaller than Kernmal after concretization. Hence, from the figure, around 80% 80% of the cases, Rmal is more precise than Kernmal. This owing to the precision and efficiency benefits and our analytical proof of soundness, which, uh, we were, which we present in the paper, that we were able to merge our implementation into the Linux kernel. Okay, so to conclude, eBPF is widely deployed and static analysis is crucial to the safety and viability of the eBPF ecosystem as a whole. Our work contributes to the eBPF verifier along three dimensions, soundness, precision, and speed. We have showed the soundness and improved the precision and speed of one part of the kernel's eBPF static analysis algorithms related to TNUM multiplication. We also prove in the paper that addition and subtraction from the kernel are maximally precise. However, there is much more work to be done. The verifier as a whole needs to be fortified with solid formal foundations. The soundness of other abstract domains in the verifier need to be considered especially given the interplay between these abstract domains. With that, I conclude this talk. Thank you for listening.